Well, good morning, CRCC, or whenever you're you're looking at this. Uh, I'm sending out this quick video because I wanted to have prayer tonight. Truly, it's uh, it's Thursday, January the 18th, and we really wanted to come in and pray. We had such a wonderful time last week. The Lord really met us here. I mean, a whole bunch went on last week, including healing. So we had a, a just a wonderful time in the Lord last week, and we wanted to continue that. It was Revelation 1 last week. It was supposed to be Revelation 2 tonight that we were going to pray through. But the weather, uh, of course, we had snow. And I'm here at the church. I've uh, kind of looked at the parking lot. It is, what time is it? It is about 1030. And so I know it'll melt some. The main roads, though, uh, coming in. In my neighborhood, it was still a lot of ice uh, on roads like Battlefield Boulevard. Uh, at least down where I was, it was pretty good. But the side roads looked pretty bad in the parking lot. Uh, has uh, not been treated and probably won't be treated. And so we'll be just relying on the Lord to melt all that out. But I just don't want to take the chance to have anyone uh, slip in our parking lot. By the time we would get to prayer tonight, it would be dark and cold again. So as much as I hate to do it, uh, we're going to cancel prayer tonight and simply trust that you spend some time, maybe that hour, that seven to eight hour you'd spend it in family worship and prayer. Having said that, I wanted to just offer a few thoughts along Revelation chapter 2. Uh, we only have one Thursday night of prayer left next week, Lord willing, uh, and, and that'll be Revelation 3. So I wanted to offer just a few thoughts that you could maybe watch this video and pray through uh, with your family or as an individual from Revelation 2. So I'm going to quickly look at Revelation uh, 2. And why don't you take this time and just go read Revelation 2. So pause this video, go get your Bible, read Revelation 2, and then unpause it and we'll continue. Okay, that was fast. All right, so uh, we're going to quickly look at Revelation 2. And I just want to point out a few areas that I think might be beneficial for our church to pray through. Our Lord, as you know, uh, in, in the uh, epistle uh, of Revelation, the book of Revelation, he sends this apocalyptic message to the Apostle John, and the, the message was addressed to seven real churches. I mean, these, these were real saints with real pastors and they met in real places, and he sent it as, I believe, uh, a, a word to encourage them, but also to warn them in some areas. And you see that reflected in the various message to the seven churches. And I have been, as I said last week in prayer, I love Revelation uh, 1, 2, and 3, just because it's, it's so relevant even today for every church everywhere. Of course, the whole Bible is, but it just, it just really gets to the heart of what's going on. Uh, not the least of which is the truth that Jesus Christ, uh, he who walks among the, uh, the seven golden candlesticks and holds the seven stars, he is still Lord of the church. And I, I know I say that a lot these days, but as I've gotten a little older, it really has become less about what I want or what I think and, and really more, which is the way it should have always been, and really a lot more about what he wants and what he thinks. So if you look at Revelation 2, the first section, the first seven verses here, he's addressing to a real church that existed in the city of Ephesus. And he, of course, he addresses the angel of the church. There's a, many uh, opinions about what that means. And he encourages them in verse 2. He knows their works. He knows their labor. He knows their patience. And thank God, uh, I, he still knows our work, our labor, and our patience. Uh, I love uh, verse 3. Uh, and has borne and has patience for my namesake and has labored and has not fainted. So the first quick area, would you pray that we would not faint, that we would faint not? Take a moment and pray that uh, we would labor the, the way he wants us to, be patient the way he wants us to. In verse 2, even that we would not bear false apostles, that we would not bear a false word, and that we would not faint, that we would not quit as a congregation. Verse 4, you know, he, he becomes uh, just very pastoral, and, and you can almost feel the Lord's heart here, where he says, I have... I have something against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Would you pray that our love for Jesus would burn hot, that we would not leave our first love, that we would recover continually, recapture continually uh, 
you know, that, that, that feeling that we felt when we first got saved, that feeling of overwhelming joy and commitment to him. And so he says in verse five, repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now that's a scary verse. A lot can be said there, but would you pray that we would be a repentant congregation, that we would absolutely stay on our faces before God uh, with a desire to please him so that our candlestick doesn't get removed. And practically speaking, I think there may be some other ramifications there, but practically speaking, that he didn't remove his hand from us, that we continue to function as a local church the way he wants us to. Uh, there's an exhortation, an exhortation concerning the Galatians, which I won't go into right now. Uh, but verse seven is important. <clears throat> uh, chapter two, he who hath an ear, let him hear. He says that over and over and over again. And I've said this before. It's because maybe many in the body of Christ don't have an ear to hear, or at least at times don't have an ear to hear. I know I've fallen into that myself, uh, where sometimes I'm hearing better. Uh, then I hear it other times. Can I get a witness? So pray that our, our ears would open, that we would not stop up our ears to anything that the Lord has commanded, that we would have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God says to the church. Okay. So as we look at Smyrna next, verse 8, And unto the angel of the church at Smyrna write, uh, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Of course, that would be Jesus. He was dead and is alive. He encourages them. A common theme, right? He knows their works, their tribulation, and their poverty. Uh, even though they are rich, he knows the blasphemy of those that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, that's strong language. I wish we had time to go into this more. But here's the Lord in the New Testament condemning those uh, or at least rebuking those in the church who call themselves Jews and are not, or in other words, call themselves followers of Jesus and are not, but are really of the church of Satan. That's that's pretty strong there. I guess maybe a point of prayer there. Lord, would you would you cause our testimony to be real, that we would not be fake believers, that Satan's still in control of us, or uh, that we would be true converts in a true church. Would you pray that, uh, that God would show us areas where we need to adjust and change? He encourages them more in verse 10. Fear none of the things which thou shalt suffer. And he talks about some of them being cast into prison. Smyrna, of course, is a church that doesn't get a strong rebuke, uh, but is a church that basically gives encouragement. <clears throat> Would you pray, saints, that if we're called to suffer for the name of Jesus and for the testimony of Jesus, that we'd be willing to do so. If we look at Pergamum next in verse uh, 12, and he, he addresses them as he who hath the sharp sword with two edges, which we also know, of course, is the word of God. He encourages them in verse 13. He says, I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast to my name. So that's an encouragement, right? He blesses them. They have not denied the faith. And they, he even mentioned, mentions a person by name, Antipas, who was the faithful martyr or the faithful witness. Would you pray that we would all have the spirit of Antipas? that we would be faithful even where Satan's seat is. And so whether that's in your home or in your job or, uh, or just in this culture, pray uh, right now that we'd be faithful regardless of what comes. Verse 14, though, they begin to get a rebuke at, uh, at Pergamum. He says he has a few things against them. Let me pause here and say, how devastating would it be to hear that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord of the church and Lord of everything else, has a few things against us. Every time I read that, I'm just, because he probably does, because we're imperfect. And it, that ought to move us. I mean, for the true believer, that ought to, just the thought that he could have something against us. Oh, Lord forbid. So um, he says that they are holding to the doctrine of Balaam, which who, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So at a minimum, we ought to pray against any stumbling blocks in our congregation and in our families. We ought to pray against any form of idol worship that exists in our 
in our living. So it may, we may not eat foods dedicated to Molech, right? But do we worship Facebook? Or I'm always picking on Facebook or Twitter because I'm on Twitter. I'll pick on Twitter or whatever or our families or whatever else we might be worshiping in the place of Jesus. And of course, we need to pray, pray for purity that we would not be involved in any form of sexual sin, which is a difficult, difficult thing in such a sexualized age. Uh, and the age, of course, the age in which we live. Uh, of course, he again mentions the Nicolotians in verse 15. I just don't have time to go there. Um, but he calls them the repentance in verse 16. And he says he's coming quickly if they don't. And so might we be quick with our repentance? Sometimes, saints, we don't need a whole lot of time to figure it out. You know, we kind of what God has told us to do is not that difficult. So uh, we need to obey quickly and we need to repent quickly. And we should pray that we would have ears to hear such a thing. Um, Thyatira is where we'll uh, finish up here in uh, in Revelation 2, starting at verse 18. And he calls himself there. Um, he says, these things saith the son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. He encourages them. He knows their works. He knows their charity. He knows their service and faith, patience, uh, again, their works, and that their works to be more than at first. So they were working, right? They, they improved in some areas. He says in verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Well, there's a lot of speculation here about Jezebel. Of course, we know going back in, into the Kings uh, that Jezebel was the was the the demonically controlled wife of Ahab, who himself had lots of problems uh, in the time of the prophet. Uh, I believe it was goodness I'm drawing a blank here. Um, Elijah. Whew, thank you, Jesus. And, uh, and so uh, there's some speculation about Revelation 220 is the Lord talking about. A woman that was alive there in Theatira. Uh, many uh, would say that there is a, a, a certain spirit that may have been upon this woman. And you hear talk today about the spirit of Jezebel. I actually do believe that there may be some application there uh, that when we act a certain way, you know, you could classify that as you know, as a Jezebelian type spirit. But here's our here's our here's our point of prayer. Those things uh, those things set aside. Here's our point of prayer that we would not tolerate Jezebel in our church, period. So anything that looks like, sounds like, acts like Jezebel, we would not tolerate it. Of course, he gives us a few things here. Uh, first, she called herself a prophetess, and so we need to beware of any false words that masquerade as words for, come from God. Uh, she seduced people and to commit fornication and to, to be involved in idol worship. We don't want any part of that. And then in verse 21, we see the mercy of Jesus. He says he gave this woman a space space to repent of her fornication, and she didn't. So would you pray that as, as the Lord gives us room to repent, and thank God he still does, that we would take advantage of that, that we would repent again quickly. A common theme here, that we would repent quickly. And he, he, issues, a, he issues a judgment. He says, behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. A lot of people don't see Jesus, even though he's king and Lord, we don't see Jesus as ruling and reigning in his church in this manner, sending judgment into the churches to cause them to repent. But this is very clear that he still does this and has every right to do so. So would you pray that CRCC would not have to get all the way to the woodshed like Thyatira did, but that we'd respond to that, that, that still small voice when the Lord corrects us so he didn't have to cast anybody anywhere <laughs> that we would move quickly when the Lord tells us to do something. Oh, goodness. Um, verse 23 is even worse. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth, searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Again. If we want the blessing of God, I'm glad we don't, we're not saved by works. But if we want the blessing in favor of God, then we need to be a prayerful, repentant, loving, obedient church. Would you pray that we grow in all of these, all of these areas?
verse, <clears throat> let's see, verse 25, but he, but that rather which ye have already, hold fast till I come. That's a good place of prayer right there, good area of prayer, that we would, we would strengthen that which remains. In other words, saying we would hold fast until he comes. We would build up the kingdom of God uh, and tarry. Uh, you know, all those are expressions that say that we need to, we need to persevere uh, as we await the coming of our Lord. And so would you pray that we would persevere? Uh, and again, he concludes in verse 29, he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So there's a lot. There's a lot that you could have picked out that I didn't. But I wanted to just give you maybe a couple points of prayer uh, as you get into uh, your prayer tonight. Hopefully you will go into prayer from 7 to 8 as a family, uh, as individuals. Uh, maybe call your brother and sister sometime today and, uh, in the church and just encourage them. Uh, there's a, there's a whole bunch of folks that are that have been really sick with this flu virus, so we want to keep them in prayer. I know Sister Josephine was in the hospital briefly. She's out now, one of our one of our senior saints. Uh, and she purposely asked me to ask the church to pray for her, so I'm being obedient. Uh, please keep her in prayer. Uh, we've had some uh, some one of our members lost his mother. Another one of our members, uh, one of our pastors, lost a couple of aunts here recently. And so uh, we've had, a, uh, you know, it's been an interesting season with sickness and loss in, in a lot of people's lives. And so be prayerful as we prayed Sunday that God would heal, that he'd stretch his hand out to heal. And uh, I hope that this has been a, a quick blessing for you. Love you all more than words can possibly express. Very, very grateful to serve this church. And uh, so let's love hard. Let's pray hard. Let's repent hard. Let's obey hard. And by his grace, uh, we'll see you in the house on Sunday with a word from Matthew chapter 6 about forgiveness. And we want to talk about why is forgiveness so difficult? Why is it so close to the, the Lord's heart? And what we could do to be people who forgive better, not just on the inside. I forgive you in my heart, but we don't want to do that. We want to be people who forgive on the inside. But we also want that forgiveness to manifest in how we love people, uh, even people who have hurt us or made us angry. And I'm going to I'm going to also talk a little bit Sunday about uh, why forgiveness is so difficult. There's something that we don't often think about as it relates to forgiveness. And I, but I don't want to give I don't want to give that away right now. So hopefully we'll see you all on Sunday. Be safe out there in the in the in the ice for today. May the Lord bless the rest of your week and uh, and uh, may his name be praised and have a good week. Talk soon.